Welcome to Obey Your Strengths with Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, Kathy Kirsten. Today on the Obey Your Strengths podcast, we have two guests in studio today with us. Our first guest is Pat Matthews from Active Capital, CEO and founder. And we've also got Lorenzo Gomez, a fan favorite from season one. Welcome, Lorenzo. Stop. Keep going. (laughs) And uh, Pat was the co-founder and CEO of webmail.us that was acquired by Rackspace back in 2007. And since then, I've known Pat from that time and have seen him work and worked for him at Rackspace. And so I'm thrilled to have him here today to talk about his strengths and how he utilizes strengths to coach others. So welcome, Pat. Thank you. Happy to be here. Pat. Tell us your top five and how they manifest themselves in you. Sure. So my top five are activator, command, maximizer, individualization, and relator. Wow. Your first three are influencing strengths. (laughs) They are. And those last two are your redeeming relationship. (laughs) People's strengths. People. Just kidding. The human side. All right. So tell us about them. Yeah. So as an activator, I I thirst for action. So when I have ideas or there's something that, you know, typically in business that that I think needs to be moved on, I tend to get after it. Um, With command, I'm, I'm somebody who I really, I like to be the leader. I like to be in charge. And so, you know, most of my life I've been an entrepreneur and, and I think that my command strength has, has sort of always helped me be the, the, the one that, that is willing to, to take charge and, and take the hill, if you will. Um, as a maximizer, I see potential in everything. Um, I, you know, I think another word for maximizer is perfectionist. Um, which has its downsides, which I, I know we're going to talk about in a little while here. Um, but but I do think maximizers they they see potential in everything. With individualization, I tend to I tend to just get to to know people really well. Really, individualization and relator I think are, are somewhat related actually. So I, I feel like with individualization, I, I see very distinct things in in people. And as a relator, I I build strong relationships with. Not everybody, but but key people in my life, I, I build very, very deep relationships. Yeah, I, I see, for, from knowing you for years, I've seen that come alive. What about you, Lorenzo? Do you see no, those no, things I, in him? Yeah, I think that it's funny because I think that one of the reasons that I gravitate to Pat is I can feel his individualization for me, which makes, it, which makes me uh, feel okay for uh, the truth. And so when I go to him, I, I, I kind of want his command to tell me the truth, but, but because of his individualization, I know it's coming from a good place. And so I, I actually thirst for it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, remind us, what's your top five? My top five uh, is uh, context, restorative, activator, positivity, and woo. Awesome. You want to tell us a little bit about each one? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I <laughs> you could probably do it in two sentences. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm very people centric, <laughs> even though it drains me. I, but I, I actually think that if, if, and this is probably not an accurate statement, but I wish the theme of my strengths was getting stuff done. Like I, like I, I endeavor to use my strengths to get wins constantly. And so I actually don't like I, I don't ever want to be thought as a thinker. I want to be thought as a doer. Yeah. And, and, and I feel like I can use my strengths very well to do that. Awesome. Well, I feel so lucky to have both of you gentlemen in my podcast studio today. So let's <laughs> We're talk. <lucky>. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see about that. So uh, thank you to both of you for your time. Yeah. You know, Pat and Lorenzo have been working together for years, and I've known them for years. Now, they know each other much better than I do. So I expect to learn a lot today in this conversation with both of you. And... Um, but we all share a, a unique story, the story of working at Rackspace, the story of learning this language of strengths and then understanding how to manage them to be productive. And Pat's got some really unique um, examples of how he's done that in his own life and helping coach others as well as the way he manages himself. And Lorenzo's here along for the ride to tell some stories. That's what you do best, dude, is tell I'm a, I'm great a storyteller. stories. Let me tell you a story. So start out and start out telling me a story about a recent conversation you had with well I, you know i think that uh, I, I, the reason i was so excited to get this episode going is you know i think that um if there was a big idea for today's episode it's this notion that if you don't watch your strengths especially your top five all of them can turn into weaknesses and and when i say that 
it sounds a little bit cliche like that old that that famous interview question so tell me about your weaknesses and sure. people go oh i'm just too hard of a worker or i work you know i care too much it's not really that kind of stuff because that stuff's really lame you know so pat and i meet probably twice a month uh when we're when we're consistent when i'm consistent <laughs> and uh and i really enjoy them because i feel like uh it's a place for me to i i can i can grapple with big ideas and things you know he he has so much more business experience than me i, I grew up in the and the individual contributor world of Rackspace, right? So entrepreneurship is a very foreign land to me, even though I've been kind of studying it. And so when we meet, I feel like I get a lot of uh, firsthand knowledge in a way that I just can't get from reading books or other people. And so we were meeting one day at a coffee shop and we were talking and we started talking about Strength Finder and Pat, you know, he, he, he basically told me about this philosophy that he has on how, you know, strengths can actually be your biggest weaknesses. And you have to watch them because if you don't watch them and you don't know how to control them, you know, because there's this notion that I can just let my top five be unbridled mm -hmm. and just let them go. And I just think that, you know, what he, the idea he submitted that day, which I'd never thought of is actually, if you let them go unbridled, it will wreck, it will wreck your life and someone else's life. Mm -hmm. And I just thought I'd never thought of it that way. I, I mean, I even summing that up, right? I mean, Pat, I feel like. Yeah, I think it's a good, it's a good summary. <laughs> Yeah, so so I think that to me, you know, and I'll just I'll just kick it off. So we we're talking about it, and I went back and I reflected on mine, and I realized that the two strengths that I'm probably the most known for are my two greatest weaknesses, which is positivity and will. And I'll tell you I'll tell you why when I let them go unbridled, they become weaknesses because I become a person who runs away from conflict. I run away from it, and and I'll tell you in a recent story, there was someone. That I had conflict with someone, and as soon as I, I and they realized that it needed to happen, I freaked out, and they emailed me and said, we need to talk right now. And because I had just had this conversation with Pat, I went, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm headed to treacherous territory. And so what I did, and it really, I think it really hurt the other person, but it was my way to wrangle them. And I said, no, 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 this was on a Friday. I said, I can't talk to you until Monday. I just can't, because I need the weekend to let my restorative strength think about how I'm going to approach this conflict because it's so foreign, it's so, it's, it's it's just so scary to me, so anxiety ridden. And I and I know I put that person through three days of torture, but I needed it in order to be my best version of my strengths. And so by the time Monday rolled around, we got on the phone and I felt way better for it. But that's me controlling my positivity woo. Because if the conflict had just come without preparation, I would have lied to the person, I would have folded, I, got, I would have got emotional, I would have gotten angry, and I feel like those are two that I have to wrangle them because I just can't let them go unleashed. I mean, is that even, you know, I felt like that was kind of what we were talking about that day at Five Points. I don't know if you'd agree with that, though. No, I, I, would, I would agree with it. I, I think that any strength that's over-dialed can become a weakness. Yes, over-dialed. a lot of what we were talking about. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. And over-dialed, I mean, I think that to me, you know, when we say over-dialed, that's just you just let it go, right? You just, you, you're, you, you turn it up to 10. And I think that the, the, also there's this notion that people can dial them up and down, right? And if you right. dial them too high, you need to watch it. I love that. So you've got some really strong people strengths. You know what I'm thinking about? I, I'm just coming to this awareness as I'm thinking about your top five, Pat. You're a people person. <gasps> I know you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Shocking. Kathy. <laughs> Shocking. But... I guess I didn't think about you in the light of three influencing themes and two relationship building themes in your top five. So that's, so I'm having this like aha moment right now that what makes you so well suited for what you're doing with active capital and investing in founders is right. doing that. So is investing in people and, and being a good judge of people and, and, delivering great coaching to people so do you do a lot of this coaching around what makes you feel strong and what makes you feel weak or where your your trip wires are so yes i do um but i'll, I'll go back a little bit so let, let me let me back up for a yeah. second so we so i have been i have been working with the the philosophy of strengths for a very long time and in fact we really embraced the the whole strengths the, the notion mm -hmm. of strengths as a you know positive psychology 
back when we were running webmail, we probably we probably started to embrace it around 2004, 2005. I can't remember if we were influenced by Rackspace or not at the time. You know, we were a big Rackspace customer back then. And so we did take, you know, we, we, we would we would learn a lot from what, what Rackspace was doing. We really admired the company. And, and I can't quite remember if we got strengths from them or not. But either way, it probably doesn't really matter. Very early on, I just really loved the notion of, like, stop trying to fix all your weaknesses and focus on your strengths. And, yeah. and to me... That is really what strengths and sort of positive psychology is is all about. And so the the notion of that really hit me very early on. And and so just like Rackspace, we you know, we had every employee take the test. We would put you know, publish what people's top five strengths were. It became a common language that we all really liked and enjoyed. I can't say that we knew exactly what to do with it, but but it was fun yeah. and it was a common language and and you know everybody really everybody really enjoyed it. And just the idea that it was positive psychology instead of trying to constantly fix what you're bad at or never going to be great at, uh, it just went over really really well. And for me, the transition after our after we sold our company to Rackspace is when I really started to think more deeply about my strengths. And and it was very apparent to me going from the leader of a small company to one of many leaders in a really, really big company that I needed to tweak how I leverage my strengths and even in many cases how I needed to dial them back. And so I, I would never say I mastered it, but but I did it was quite a learning experience as as I went through that and, and just realized that over time I want to spend more time mastering my strengths and dialing them back and also putting myself in situations where my strengths can be really powerful. Can you give us some examples? You know, one example that, that really hits me is for a long time, I was a CEO of a startup company. And, you know, as the CEO, I could set the, the tone f- for the business. And, you know, we, we were a small company. And so uh, being nimble was really one of the, the biggest strengths that we had against our larger competitors. And so as an activator, it suited me very well. You know, we, we needed, we would, we were in constant learning mode and as we would find new learnings or things that we wanted to accomplish, we would, we would move quickly. We would get after it. And I would really set the pace for that. And, and, you know, my activator would, would really come out and, and flourish. Once we were acquired by Rackspace and, and I started to integrate into the bigger company, I realized that my activator could create a lot of whiplash inside <laughs> of a larger organization. And so that was really the one that I, I started to realize that I had to dial back a little bit. There were others that I probably should have dialed back in, in certain instances, which we can also talk about. But activator was really the first one that that it it hit me that I need to be more thoughtful before I ever make a decision or pursue, you know, a big item. Um, whereas in the past, in the small company, we just get after it really, really quickly. And we needed that activator. And I think we needed it at, Rack, at Rackspace as well, but it needed to be toned down a little bit. I, I agree with you that Rackspace had a culture of activation in some parts of the business. Right. Uh, but we could also see the whiplash. I, th- I love that. Right. I love that term because so much of what Activator brings to the table moves so fast and gets people going. But if you are a strategic leader in a large organization, you could overstep your bounds across multiple organizational structures. Right. And yeah. And go activate someone on the front line that leaves everybody else going like, whoa, right, wait, right. what? So yeah, activation without a lot of communication in a big company can can really cause mm. problems. You know, one of the other things too. So I know in strengths you like to talk a lot about partnerships with other people, yes. and one of the other reasons why I realized that my activator needed to be toned down a little bit at Rackspace was that I also worked for probably one of the world's biggest activators. <laughs> and so I kind of saw firsthand that, you know, the, activator, the carnage. <laughs> activator upon activator was a little bit much as well. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of times when you're watching other people, you can observe how, you know, some of those actions can, can be good and bad as well. And so, uh, it, it really hit me at that point that, that my, I needed to put my activator on the shelf yeah. more That's often so than funny. not. That's so funny. Yeah. I, so I have activator and it's funny cause I, I feel the same thing, but from a different, cause I, I was, I was never, I mean, I was a leader for a little bit, but I always felt like the reasons that I was told that we couldn't activate were always BS. And so it just turned, it just made me have a really 
bad attitude because I was like, I'm happy to not activate. But if you're telling me that it's just because the process says we shouldn't, like I would get so mad. And it's ultimately why I left because I was like, you know, this is like you're not going to give me a good reason, which is my, really my restorative. Like, so tell me why. And if not, I'm out of here. And it, and I think that my activator was so dialed up that I left because of it. Yeah. Because I just couldn't. I was like, this is. Yeah, it makes this. sense. Well, as a strategic person sitting in that, you know, so mm. strategic being my number one input mm. learner, maximizer, <laughs> belief being my top five, feeling y'all's activation, y'all, feeling yeah. your activation ma made me feel like a sense of urgency, mm. but also a desire to put on the brakes to say, wait a minute, where are we going so I can make the best plan to get there and I can go research it and put my you know, learner hat on. No, Kathy, just tell me where to go and I'll go. And yeah. if it's wrong, you yell at me and I'll turn around and well, I'll come right Well, that's back. what I learned. <laughs> well, to meet in the middle on this, I think what I appreciate about activators is the amount of risk you're willing to take. Oh, yeah. And the amount of um, grace you're willing to, do, to give if we don't hit the destination as we said we would because there was learning along the way that was totally valuable. Yeah where my strategic sometimes would get caught up in, well, it's just really important we get to the destination. And an activator says, well, we took a left turn in Boise, Idaho. It doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> and, I love that. And, you know, that, so that's where I kind of think I met in the middle on that. But I'm glad you shared that story. I love that. <laughs> you know, what, one other story of uh, that, that is a, a learning moving from both being the leader of a small company to being an executive mm -hmm. in a much larger company is with my command strength. And so my command strength, I, I think, has always served me very, very well in, in business and really in life in general. You know, and, and I, I think that my command strength as a leader of a company has has served me very well. Where I, where I had to edit my command or, or looking back, wish I probably would have edited it a little bit more or adjusted it a little bit more is when I joined the senior leadership team at Rackspace because, you know, I kind of always had this, like, I always had this vision of what it's like to be on a senior leadership team of a really big company. And when I joined the senior leadership team of a really big company, it was the exact opposite of what I thought. <laughs> And I thought that there was just going to be a ton of command in the room. I thought there would be a ton of command activator in the room. And, and actually, it was not that. And so, What was it? Strategic? It, it was a lot of not that. Game of Thrones? <laughs> well, self-assurance. I mean, there was a lot at that point. There was the a time. lot of self-assurance, but there was a lot of, of quietness. Interesting. There was a lot of chess playing. Uh, yeah, yeah, chess and, playing. And, that's a better and, way to put and it. And so, you know, and, and maybe, 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 yeah, maybe another, you know, phrase for that is, you know, passive aggressiveness. Mm, mm. And I just never imagined, like, I always thought the way that people climb to the top of a corporate organization it's is by being direct and expressing their feelings and pounding the table for ideas that they believe <laughs> yes. in. And I walked into the absolute opposite. <laughs> well, what I want to, okay. Hold, this is awesome. I and, and by the way, I was, I was 31 years old. Oh, that's okay. And yes. I had just sold my company. And so I'm sure my head was a little bit bigger than it should have been. <laughs> um, but either way, like I brought my command to, to those meetings and it did not always serve me very well. <laughs> So do you feel like you have a really sensitive temperature thermometer of passive aggressive? I do. Very, because it's, I'm, I'm very sensitive to it. Actually. So if you mm. practice, and I hate it. Actually. You practice lots of social courage. I mean, that's command, right? Social courage that you pretty much say what you're thinking. And if you sense something term. going on, yes. you're going to talk about it. So even if I have something going on and I'm just noodling on it, for a while and I'm not yet prepared to make comments on it because I'm still trying to understand it. You might He's already you might it. sense that as passive aggressive. Like, come on, I Kathy, do. tell me what you're thinking. Just get it out. Yeah, I know there's a problem. Where I'm not yet quite ready to communicate it. Mm, right. Mm. It, it could be. So I think that's a I think that's command, right? The lens it you is. see the world through. Like can't stand passive aggressiveness. Like let's just talk about it. Yes. Okay, so because I don't—that was my entire upbringing. <laughs> Be passive aggressive. <laughs> no, I'm fine. Because when I think about that leadership team, I didn't think passive aggressive. I actually thought they were pretty willing to throw it all out on the table. That's but, what I thought too. Not but the case. you see, yeah, not the case. 
And there were a couple very powerful leaders in the room. Yes. I mean, you know, we yeah. had world class yeah. leaders at, at Rackspace, and but but I think in some ways the 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 world class leaders made it a little bit scary for professional executives to speak mm. their mind. Mm. And you know, professional executives are just very calculated people. <laughs> yeah. And it's I'm such... not very good with calculated people. Like <laughs> I just want to, you know, let's get to the point. Yeah. We got competition out there that's moving faster than we are. What are we doing? You know, trying to measure every next step and so yeah and a professional executive is thinking whoa whoa like i have 30 people that report to me and yeah. i'd like it to be 35 right. you know like like none of their a lot of their objectives right. have nothing to do with the with the, the company per se but their goals or their right. their agenda well, well i okay yes and or <laughs> i would like to keep 30 people and not have yeah. to lose five of them to you yeah that's right true. so i think some of actually, it actually isn't great just story. all empire by building yes but there was yes. a lot of empire building. yeah and protecting <laughs> empire protecting yeah yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. No, no, sorry, Kathy. You go, saw go. it from the, you, you were in the room and I wasn't. <laughs> okay. So I love this. So tell me about your command. Like, can we talk about command? So few people who have been on my podcast so far have been able to tell us a little bit about the inside of your head of command. I'm happy to talk about whatever you want. You're going to have to lead me a little bit though. May you I, bet. may I jump in here? I want to jump in on command. Okay. Because I think the command has a crappy brand i think that it has it has been misbranded by the world and and i'll tell you a very personal story to me is i was going off when i was about 23 about my old boss at command and i was and i and i was painting it out to be very bad strength and i was doing this to my best friend dax moreno and at one point he paused and looked at me and he said hey man i have command in my top five and I wanted to crawl under my chair. And I had just been talking trash about it for at least 15 minutes. And I, and I realized that my best friend Dax had literally been hiding his command from everyone, including me, because of the bad brand that it was. He, didn't, he did not, he was trying to maneuver his entire career as being not seen as a command. Mm. And it really upset me that he, that he identified before I did, that it had a bad brand and he needed to manage it. And I just thought, how crappy is that that this guy has to hide the thing that's his strength? And and when I went back and I realized that, you know, that it was his command that actually was part of how, why I was drawn to him. Why one of the main reasons we were such good friends is because he was the one that wasn't afraid to 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 sense my passive aggressiveness and say, hey, dude, we need to talk about this. And, was, ah! and so I needed him. And But I just think that on behalf of all the commands out there, it, just, it, it, it needs to be rebranded because it is a strength. I would also say anybody with command that tries to hide their command may not have real command. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> we'll have Dax Moreno on episode... <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. No, but, it, but it wasn't like he was hiding it. It's no, like, no, it's like him watching him ride a bull. Like he's trying to stay on yeah. for eight seconds. No, he's biting his lip, right? Yeah, yeah I mean, exactly. I he's biting his lip. Like exactly. people who have competition in their top 10 strengths and they try to act like. Because yeah. they have had so many neg and, and perhaps he's had yes. some negative. Yes. Misaligned command can be really bad though. I mean, you can yeah. really just be, end up being a jerk. And, yeah, 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 yeah. And so you do have to you do have to manage it. Well, I think that you know to the whole point of this episode, if it's unmanaged, you just get it done. But there are bodies everywhere. Right. There's bodies, you know, body at every ten. Steps. I remember a couple of months into our acquisition uh, by Rackspace, Graham told me that he said, "Oh, by the way, you know, command activators don't really last at Rackspace." <laughs> Thanks for convincing me to sell you my company. Sign, <laughs> sign me up for four years. That is awesome. You showed them, bro. Yeah, you I laughed. think there was one command, legendary command activator yeah. at Rackspace <laughs> yeah. that everybody latched on to. And, 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 and know, that, after that, you know, I, yes. I was walking in the wake of other command activators. But, but, but I, I do point, think it was another yeah. danger, too, by the way, of like yeah. pattern recognizing too much with this kind of stuff. Mm. I did last six years. Yeah, of course. See, of course. Yeah, it's there's a a, a sincere um, temptation to go. Oh well, I know a command person who left me in the bloody trail. So therefore, every command exactly. is. And you're, and, and that's and what happened. It matters so much what else is around that command, according to strengths, right? Like you've got the individualization and relator, and I teasingly said those are your redeeming strengths right? right because the other things might make me feel like you're just moving me to get things done the influencing side but then there's the other side of yeah. indiv individualization and relator have those two ever been un 
overused or dialed up too high? I, I think those end up getting dialed up in very different ways. So with me, for example, I think that my relator runs really deep. And, and so I think the downside of that is it can be hard to really penetrate my world, you know? And, yeah. and, and so it, like I, I, I do very well. Like I think of myself as like a kind of a small group extrovert. I'm very much an introvert by the way, but I think of myself as a small group extrovert. A lot of people that will have an initial meeting with me, especially if it's one-on-one -on -one or in a small group, they'll be shocked to realize that I'm actually an introvert, but in very small groups, I, I can be very extroverted. When I get out into the wilderness, I'm much, much more introverted. Mm. I also think that with individualization, I tend to see things in people in a very positive way, but I can end up discounting some of the negative things in, in those people as a result. And that can get you in, in messy situations too. And yeah. so I, I need to be careful of that. I was just working with a team this week who has the leader has individualization number one. And after the team session, some of people I was sharing feedback with, or they were giving me feedback of the, of the working session, talked about how she gives people chance over chance over chance and moves them around and tries to find the right alignment. Right. And I pointed to the individual individualization on her card and said, it's probably due to that. Yep. Yeah. I think one of the things about individualization and leadership, for example, again, going back to my experience building a small company and then being an executive in a much larger company in the small company, individualization, I think is really, really valuable because without a lot of people, you can have very, you can have people with very specific talents as the company starts to grow and you have more and more people overall, you have more people questioning, like, are those talents enough to make up for all the deficits? And, you know, in a bigger company, you need people that can fit in a little bit more. In a smaller company, you're much more apt to have people that are a little bit, you know, crazy or risk taking or what have you mm. as well. And, and you're, I think in a smaller company, you can just, you can find those really spiky strengths and overlook yeah. those really tough weaknesses that in a larger company just the you, yeah they stand you, out yeah they stand out a lot more mm. that's fascinating so let, let's okay so the, so the theme of today is you know how they become weaknesses and I think that to me you know I think that you're you're sitting in a position where you're interacting with you know dozens and dozens and dozens of entrepreneurs and companies all and so I, I'm sure you're seeing strengths like crazy. And I just, <laughs> I just, I want to throw one out there as a one dialed up too because I see it too from my world of geekdom is when ideation runs amok, <laughs> you know, and how it's in it's nothing wrong with having ideas. Those those people are brilliant, and I've seen them do it brilliantly. But then it's like some people just can't get anything done. It, would that fit your 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 philosophy of the dialed up to be a weakness? I mean, I certainly think it can be. I, I, I think that people with ideation probably need to pair with activators, yeah. as an example, or achievers. Um, you know, if it, I think that, you know, there's a whole category of entrepreneurs out there that just sort of have a new idea every day, but can never <laughs> make progress on that idea. Um, you know, to me, that is much more of an idea person than an entrepreneur. And mm -hmm. so I think as an, like, as an entrepreneur, you have to be well-rounded enough to be able to either have great ideas yourself or borrow them from others and figure out how to make progress on them. How do yeah. you build the product? How do you get it to market? Um, and all of these strengths can be conflicting. Like as a maximizer, you may never want to launch the thing. You want to make it better and better and better and better. But either hope you have Activator or partner with somebody that has Activator who realizes that we got to get to market and start getting some feedback on the product. And we can always, there's always time to make it better. Um, yeah. Hey, Kathy, we got to release this podcast. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Give me a couple of more days. <laughs> it's so true. So, so another question about just in general, you know, the, uh, so when we talked about, you know, your strengths, how your strengths can come out as weaknesses, let's, let's just uh, scrimmage a working definition for our audience. Is it, would it be a true statement to say that when you don't put the time in to manage, let's say your top five and you, and they're unbridled that they can act quickly become your biggest weaknesses. So the way I think about it is that if they are 
unbridled, and if you're in the wrong, you're you're applying them in the wrong lane. Got it. And the the combination of applying a strength in the wrong lane and have it, having it dialed up too far can be a real problem. Give me an example of the wrong lane. So I think if your command strength is dialed up way too far as an employee inside mm. a big organization, mm. I think you're going to struggle. Yeah. But if you're the leader of the company and you know it's dialed up pretty good, it's a it, it can be a it can be quite a strength. Got it. I think you need to understand and harness your strengths so that you can put yourself in the right position to utilize them. Yeah. And and look, if you're utilizing them properly and you're swimming in the right lane or working the right job or you know doing what you're great at, you can dial them up more and more and more. Mm. But I think the minute you get outside of that lane, then you've really got to work to to manage them and, and dial them back down a little bit. Like I, I think a great example is look, maximizers get picked on a lot because they're sort of these perfectionist type people. <laughs> and so look, I think in business that can be great if if you still can figure out how to get the product launched and you're not just going to like tweak on it and try to make it perfect right. forever. Right. I also think that as a maximizer, you've really got to push yourself to figure out what really matters if you're building a product or a podcast or whatever it is, because at yeah. some point you got to ship it. Right. However, while maximizers can do great things in business, I, you know, for me, a, a big challenge has been in my personal life. I've got to figure out how, how to not make my maximizer really be a, a nitpicker. You know, because this is the chat, like, you know, my, my, I always want my house to be perfect or, you know, I see all the little challenges around me and right. that can be very annoying to people. Mm. So anyways, I, I just think that all of a sudden a strength, you change lanes, whether it's going from your professional life to your personal life That's or so from good. one job to another. And all of a sudden that strength has got to either be dialed up or down. This is so good. Is that so good? And I think you're, you're right on when you shared the story about moving from CEO of your small company to a, one of many leaders in a large company as your role changes, you need to dial up and adjust your sales. That's like right. dial up, dial down, adjust your sales. That's right. Because it's not going to fit everywhere. And you can make a conscious effort to do that. I think perhaps our podcast could lead people astray to say, because it's named Obey Your Strengths, meaning you just do what your strengths desire to mm, do. Mm. It's not always appropriate to do what your strengths are desiring to do. Right. And you have to be a good manager of that. I think ultimately we, we all should be working to figure out how we can be swimming in the right lane most of the time yeah. to best harness our strengths and dial them up as much as possible. But the reality is we all live complex lives That's, and yeah, we've yeah. all got to adjust the dials as we go. Well, look, I think in everything in life, there are rules and limits, you know, I mean, show me in any aspect of the world where the, you don't have limits and rules that govern things. I mean, it's just how you gotta, it's how you gotta live your life. I, so, so I want to talk about one that we talked about it at, uh, at coffee because uh, I have this one. And, and there was an example you gave me, which I loved because it's me. So I'll say, so my positivity, it's my number four. When I was at Rackspace, it's so great because everybody wants to sit next to me because we're going to have fun for 40 hours. Mm -hmm. Like we're just going to have a blast and I'm going to ah. be singing and laughing. And now I'm in a world where I get asked to meet and, and have coffee and go to this event. And my positivity, it, so much so that there are more things I re get requested than there are hours in a day. And my positivity doesn't know what to do except smile and say yes. And so <laughs> one of the things that Pat pointed out is my positivity can make me a little bit of a fibber, a liar. Because someone will go, hey man, let's go, let's go hang out. Are you good? And I'm like, yeah. I just think that I think high positivity can oftentimes lead to very low follow through. <laughs> yeah, it's a better way to say it. And yes, I don't really like liar. <laughs> so I'm maximizing you there, bud. But I'm yes, sorry. Yeah, my therapist low. wouldn't like people that either. with positivity. You know, yeah. we 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 all want to, or many of us want to gravitate towards people with positivity. They're yeah. positive. They're cheery. They're happy. Right. I just think that. That's if you don't watch it dialed up. Yeah. You know, I, I think that one of the challenges with people that have positivity is they don't want to say no. It's they totally don't right. want to bring up a negative yes. answer or yes. answer with a negative connotation. And so, so what ends up happening is they're just, they're very cheery. They so say yes, right they, they say yes to everything, <laughs> but there's no way they, they don't even have the intention to follow up on it a lot of the time. <laughs> yes. 
And, <laughs> and actually the world that, that I am in now and, and what makes me very different in the world that I'm in now is not that, not just that I'm direct, but most of my competition is not direct. They're very, they, they you mm. know, there's a, there's a term in the, in the venture capital and entrepreneur world that I like to use a lot. It's happy talk. Oh, tell happy us about talk. it. Well, so, so if you think about it, I get pitches all the time from entrepreneurs that, that want me to they need money. They, want they money. need money. At the end of the day, they need money. Well, yeah, 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 and, yeah. and you know, whenever you're getting pitched by an entrepreneur, it's, it's like common sense would, would tell you that, you know, you should be positive to them and you should prop them up and you should encourage give, them, encourage them and give them great feedback and, and all that kind of stuff. And people with positivity will just load you up with that. I mean, you know, I talk to entrepreneurs all the time who they, they, by the time they get to me, they're like, everybody loves it. Everybody loves it. And I say, okay, how many, che- how many has anybody written a check? Okay. <laughs> And, and so what I do a little bit differently is I, I try to use my individualization to really understand what it is they're talking to me about. And then I try to give them candid feedback on it. And that sets me apart in a, in a, in a world where there's very little candid feedback. Mm. And that's very, I, I think it's very, very powerful. And actually the, the, the thing that goes against what would be thought of as, as maybe common sense is the appreciation that entrepreneurs have for the direct direct feedback and and candor because they get the opposite everywhere else. And as an entrepreneur, I mean, you you know, all all you've really got is time. You know, you, you cannot waste time. It's like the classic dating example where it's like, no, no, it's not you. It's me. You're great. You're awesome. When it's actually like, no, I don't like you. (laughs) And I don't want to go out. what What I love though is that, you know, as far as like my quote unquote competitors, or really just other venture capitalists and investors is they can't really just listen to this podcast and, and, and change their behavior because they're just not built that way. Right. You know, they're right. built to, to sort of have all that positivity and, and right. give you the happy talk. And, and it just makes them so uncomfortable to tell you <laughs> the truth. <laughs> and so I just I, I love it. I, that's what I do differently. <laughs> But, you know, to, to bring it back to what we're talking about on this podcast is that I am, as an entrepreneur, I am putting myself in the lane that allows me to right. dial up some of these strengths. And still there are times where I have to dial them back down or I, you know, I may be talking to an entrepreneur that I can just tell they're having a bad day or they're feeling too beat up. And so it, it also doesn't do any good just to be a jerk. And so yeah, that's right finding that balance and and really sort of understanding where the person is in the conversation. I think these things really matter. And uh, so, yeah. Do you feel in those pitch meetings that you sit through, and there's got to be lots of them, (laughs) do you feel yourself changing how much command you're using when you see how the pitch team is presenting themselves? Uh, Absolutely. Because... I think there's such a sensing ability with command. And if you sense high competition or high command, you go toe to toe with that style of communication. Would you agree? Yes. Can you give us an example like of how, like, you know, where you have sensed it or where you've gone un Pat Matthews like soft on someone because they lacked it? I would, I would say, would it, would it be a true statement on, on top of Kathy's question to say that a lot of people that come in, these entrepreneurs have self-assurance okay. and they've lied to themselves thinking that they're better than they are or that their product's better than it is? I think most entrepreneurs have unbridled optimism, <laughs> which you kind of need that. And I mean, building a company is really hard. You know, sticking your neck out there, first of all, is, is really difficult. And, and ju- just doing that alone, just taking the step to quit your job yeah. and start a company, yeah. most people don't do. And then when you do it and it's actually time to build a company, it's a really, really hard thing to do. Mm. And, and so, I, you know, you almost, you have to stay positive as an entrepreneur, but everything's a balancing act. So y- while you've got to be super optimistic, you've also... I believe have to be very willing to, to take feedback. A lot of times actually when, when, where I will do what you mentioned earlier and maybe go a little softer actually is when I can tell they don't like the feedback. And a lot of times it's people with really, really high unbridled dialed up self-assurance <laughs> that 
you just kind of realize that they don't value the feedback. They don't really want it. They, you know, continuously interrupt you, you know, all the, all these kind of things. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, look, I'll just sort of say, that's okay. Like, I, I'm not here. I like, I don't need to hear myself talk. I'm not here to right. just, you know, I, just give you a bunch of unsolicited advice. I mean, I, 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 it, it's why I, I really enjoy working with a lot of founders because I, I think great founders know, I, I actually think one of the ingredients of being a great founder and a great entrepreneur and a great business person is that you know how to take advice. Mm. You know how to, you know, sense things from all yeah. over the place. That you're coachable. How, you, you know how to listen, you know how to be coachable. And then ultimately you can, you know, take all of those inputs and turn around and figure out how to make your own decision with it all. But there's a real art to being able to, to, to do that kind of stuff. And I gravitate towards people that, that are good at that. I wish there was a, a strength for coachability, mm. you know, because it's this, you know, are you even open to it? Are you even open? Uh, you know, because a lot of them say they are, and they, but really they just want money, you know, give me the check pad. Um, well, I think there could be some strengths for coachability learner yeah right? wanting to yeah. learn some more wanting to learn more mm. input gathering data you know gathering yeah. feedback uh, but some strengths are going to make you blind to it like you're talking about self-assurance yep Shut yeah self-assurance is a, is a good one i mean it's a it's also a real strength too so you know my business partner webmail his name's bill he's very very high self-assurance and what it's taught me over the year actually what i love about bill one of the many things i love about bill is that he has very high self-assurance, but very low sensitivity. Mm. And so what that actually means is that you can really challenge him in very aggressive ways. And actually it's what it takes to get him over his self-assurance hump on things that he is wrong on. But at the same time, it's while you, I can be very aggressive with him without hurting his feelings. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's the key. Yeah. And, and so, and, but understanding That's that I think is, is really powerful. So, you know, Bill's also a pretty quiet guy. And so what I've realized over the years is that a lot of people will try to influence him on something and back away immediately. Mm. Not, not because he's like going to, you know, rip your head off or be super aggressive, but he just kind of, you know, his self-assurance doesn't allow him to necessarily embrace the new idea right away. And because he's kind of a quiet guy that doesn't engage in the, in the debate per se, people will just walk away, not even try again. And I think it's one of the things that's made me and him really powerful over the years is that I will take my sort of activator command. I, I guess really it starts with individualization. I mean, I, I know him really well. Like I know his, you know, little mm. quirks and ticks or strengths, I guess we yeah. call them. <laughs> and, and. And I apply my sort of activator command, whatever it is, I don't know, um, so, to, to, to sort of getting through to him. And I don't know, it's just, it's created a really good partnership. It doesn't mean I'm always right, you know, and it does certainly doesn't mean he's always wrong. But, you know, one of the other things that's also m made me do with him, like with his self-assurance being so high, is like I'm, I, I go in a little more prepared to, to the meeting, <laughs> you know, when I want to change his mind on something. I think through it a little bit more. And... And then, I, and then I go in tough. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So I, I want, I want to pause and talk about self assurance because I think it's one of the other strengths that's been misbranded. And if I, if I, if I ask myself internally about it, I actually think that I used to think self assurance meant that it was superiority, that you thought you were superior to me, when actually it's just I believe in my ideas strongly, which is a completely rad. You know, one is I'm above you. And one is, no, I think my ideas are right. And, and I, I, I learned this kind of like little nuance by watching Graham because Graham has self-assurance. And I think what, what threw me is he also has ideation. So I, I used to him always being open to ideas. And then there was one time where I saw his self-assurance come out and he, with, with a group of people. And it was like, no, no, no. This thing I'm telling you is a fact. <laughs> And, and it was like, oh, we're not in ideation mode anymore. This is in, and I just went, I've never, I, I had never seen it that way though. And it's in the notion that I have strong opinions about my ideas and because you know what, I'm not dumb. I've researched it. I've looked into it and I have a strong opinion, but I'm willing to be, I'm willing to change it, but you have to come in with superior, you know, data. It's that whole Mark Andreessen strong opinions loosely held, right. you know, like I feel like you have self-assurance, but you're not willing to, yeah. you know. Self-assurance can be very powerful. I mean, p people want to follow people that, that have strong ideas yeah. and that are confident. pave a path and they're confident. And that, that's why, 
you know, I mean, command is sort of one of those strengths that if if done right, people want to follow because they want to follow somebody who's going to charge the hill or pave the path and somebody with self-assurance. I mean, a lot of, a lot of these types of strengths, I think, create clarity for people. Mm. Um, and I think that's powerful. I think clarity is really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a strength that I can talk about as a weakness. Yes. <sighs> You're in the trust tree, Kathy. I am. And I think lots of folks, I know for, because I have been doing coaching for 12 <laughs> years, lots of people struggle with this. Uh, it's responsibility. Mm. So when my responsibility is turned up too high, it sounds like this. If I become aware of a problem, I'm responsible for the problem. Right. Great personal personal life, professional life does not matter. Suddenly I feel like I am the one who wants to be dependable, who has a hard time saying no, who wants to help. So I would catch myself even saying yes to things I didn't even know what the full detail was. Mm. Can you help me, Kathy? Yes. On Load what? me up, coach. <laughs> yeah, Load on me what? Up. <laughs> and right. I have very little executing strengths. I'm pretty much a two trick pony type of thing i'm a strategic thinker plus an influencer and i just have this responsibility strength that is being one of my only executing strengths so it's very difficult for me to actually follow through responsibility without execution sounds kind of like torture <laughs> it, it's sort of like mental yeah. it's like a mental guilt trip yeah you, you well because it's psychological it's ownership it's psychological it ownership is. of something you look very is. stressed out it is and so like Anytime I'm put into a role where I am being stretched in multiple positions, like today, I mean, to be like to give the audience a, a peek inside this studio room, I have a second grader sitting in here with us who is out of school today because she's ill. And it was a real struggle this morning when I woke up going, oh, my God, I got Pat Matthews on his I'm on his calendar <laughs> and I'm on Lorenzo's calendar. There has to be like unicorns and rainbows <laughs> above my head because these two busy gentlemen well, yeah, are in my studio busy. and I have this little sick kid. That happened to me um, in 2013. We talked about this in episode zero. That was kind of the unwielding of my career. But let's talk about responsibility. Like help me from your strength set. Now, Lorenzo, I'm pointing at you because I know you have the responsibility. It's my number, number six. six. Okay. It's my number six. And and to to Pat's, you know, uh, the, 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 the inspiration for this episode being weaknesses, you can, it's, it can be such a weakness for me that you can even say, do you have too much on your plate? And I will say, no, I'm fine. <laughs> and I, and load me up. It's exactly, load me up, coach. And I, you know what I think of it? I have this visual of responsibility where, you're bear hugging a bunch of like pillows and they just keep adding more. And eventually the one in the middle drops or it's like, you know, vases uh -huh. and it, the one in the middle just drops and shatters. Yeah. And, but you don't let go of any of them. You keep bear hugging until the things in the middle just start falling. Mm -hmm. And that's responsibility where, and you just won't say nothing. Like someone can see you completely overwhelmed and go, hey, are you, are you, are you good for this extra one? Totally. I'm totally good for it. <laughs> it Come on, bring it on. It's, so, yeah. but, but like, do you have responsibility in your top strengths, Pat? First of all, it's a very weird visualization. <laughs> so thank you for hey, it. That, I love the wind, though. <laughs> Me, you know, He's you want to bear hug you? Brain. I will bear He's hug you. Beautiful brain. <laughs> so I do not have responsibility, what would you but I love people that do. Oh, dang. <laughs> yes, that you love yeah, us. because we'll do everything that you want us to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I can think of times where you and I Pat's share like, hey, I got something I need your help with. Yeah, I'm yeah. in, bro. Yeah. yeah, you can communicate and I'll take it on. Yeah, look, I think I love responsibility as a strength. People with responsibility, I mean, the, the positive side of it is they want to be counted on. You right. Know, they, they want to please. They want to get, you know, they want to do good things. I think that when I, when I think about the downsides of responsibility, I always think of it as like a management slash leadership thing where as if you're leading somebody that has responsibility that's way dialed up, you have to work to not send them so much stuff. Right. Mm. And you have to work to help them understand what their true priorities are. And, you know, but, but look, if, if managed properly, I think it's a great strength. It's just tough to have internally. It's a burden. Yeah. It's a burden. I think it's, you know, in a leadership position makes it difficult for you to delegate and also sometimes give feedback right honest feedback yeah, because yeah. 
I recall when I was leading others that sometimes I felt like I could have done a better job of setting expectations so we wouldn't be at this point right here, that now I'm going to have to deliver bad feedback because you didn't, you weren't held, you weren't accountable. Or maybe Mm. I didn't hold you accountable enough. So I always reflected it back on myself as to what was my failure before I would hold the other person accountable for their failure, which in the end was a huge lesson for me of setting expectations correctly in the beginning and clearly and maybe even documenting them for myself Mm. so i would remember i was super clear about getting xyz done right well i think that i think that also to borrow one of pat's phrases like if 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 the notion is to find yourself in the right lane to let you dial your strength up or down i think that with responsibility you also need boundaries And so everybody with responsibility needs to come up with their own set of boundaries because when you you will absolutely bump up against it and if you don't have any boundaries you're just going to keep saying yes what boundaries have you set up lorenzo well i think that to me you know i have so as a as an ecosystem person i feel like everybody in the ecosystem is fair game to ask me for stuff right and so my responsibility gets overwhelmed and the boundaries i've set up are no 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 there's there's a there's an amazing executive named Alexandra who runs the foundation and there's a guy amazing guy named David who runs Geekdom and and my my response so the 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 battle is I still want to say yes because I want to be helpful but the boundary is if someone just says the word nonprofit I need to stop them mid sentence go Alex is your gal mm. if someone says startup or no, 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 go to Geekdom and so to me I those are the boundaries that I've set up now I can do a very uh, my, let me. My therapist will get mad at me. In the past, I have done a. I have done a bad job of adhering to my boundaries, and I just need to work to do to do yeah. better. Yeah. Hey, every day we re, we're recalibrating. That's right? right. I mean, That's right. this is our hard wiring is to be helpful. Yeah. So it's it's very difficult to. Yeah. But also, that also in, in to the core of strengths, I do think that, you know, we talk about partnerships. I think that if you have responsibility, you need to partner with someone who actually can tell you. You are completely overdoing it. You're overburdening yourself, and like you, because you already know it, right? Totally. And which, which is why I think that you know you have to partner with people with those strengths that can actually point it out. I find command a great partner. I do. Like, I when you said these strengths help drive clarity, I think there's few strengths that do it better than command. Actually, yeah, because command can cut through all the emotion of something and, and give clarity. So I was kind of wanting some clarity on that. <laughs> from Pat. But, but I, yeah. I was welcoming some coaching. I also, after this, welcome coaching on my maximizer because you are a fellow maximizer. Mm. And that one's a tough one for me. Well, you said something to me about maximizer, which I really love, which was, uh, I think it's in the personal lane or maybe it's in both, which is, hey, I notice everything. I'm not going to stop it. But sometimes I just need to ask myself, is it worth pointing it out? Right. Right. And it's a challenge when you notice everything and you're very direct. <laughs> And so I've really had to, I've had to work on that. I would not say I've mastered it by any stretch, but I'm aware of it Mm. maybe more than ever. And it's something that Mm. I continue to work on. I have a great individualization story. Yes. Tell us. Maybe I can squeak in here. Yes. And you know, when when I, when I think of, when I think of the challenges of individualization, you know, one, one person comes to mind that I work uh, closely with a lot and she is, she is my designer. So she, my interior decorator, she's helped design my house. She is helping design my office now. She is uh, helping. She's just, she helps me design stuff like in the yeah, physical yeah. world. Okay. Okay. And she's super, super talented. She's very direct. I don't know what her strengths are, but you know, somewhere in there, I mean, there's a bunch of designy ones, I'm sure, but she's also <laughs> like very command oriented, very knows exactly what she wants to do, which I love. Like I, I, yeah. I love finding people that are real, like really master of their niches. And, and she is one of those. The challenge I have is that whenever you're you're designing a house or you are designing an office or you've got a you know you've got to go from design to construction mm-hmm. and then there's multiple people involved I have I have challenges getting her to sort of play nice with others in the in the sort of ecosystem <laughs> of house building or 
<laughs> house decor or, you know, construction or whatever it is. And I don't want to, I don't want to give up on her because I think she's so good at what yeah. she does, but she has to work just directly with me, which makes me, you know, which, which yeah. just, it just doubles creates, your workload. It, well, it doubles my workload and it creates complexities all over the place. <laughs> now in the end, when you walk into the house or the it's office amazing. or whatever, it's amazing and it's going to be awesome. And she's super talented. But to me, it's a total example of individualization where if, if, if I were running a much bigger operation, I would, I would probably be challenged here yeah. um, to, to continue to use her in a, right. in, a, in a more scaling way or in a way where maybe I'm not the one making all the decisions on the house decor or, or what have you. But I, you know, I, I've been working with her for probably a decade now and it, it, it there's been challenges yeah. all over the place. Yeah. So if you're, if your entire life got acquired by, right. you know, <laughs> like you, you, you probably wouldn't keep her. You right. probably couldn't right. because your individualization wouldn't, you would just be in a new lane. Right. I'd be in a new lane. See, I'm learning. I'm learning the jargon right now. That's and a great even one. now, I'm swerving lanes <laughs> in between lanes. Right. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering: is it kind of like she's managing you? I mean, is it? I mean, or no, 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 no. Wait, rephrase: is it kind of like you're managing someone that's like you? I mean, I yourself? I am ma- managing someone that's like me. So her self assurance is super spiky. I don't know exactly what, again what all her strengths sure, are. Sure. Sure. I think my point though is I really like that. Right. Other people in my life do not necessarily. Yeah. And right. Other people that she needs to work with. Right. To get things done or to get other influence from do not. It just does not always go very well. I, I think this is something you find with designers actually because, mm-hmm. see, great design. Actually, most great things in life do not are not a result of compromise. Mm. They're not. Right. Yeah. And in fact, in my, my sort of opinion, which gets me in trouble sometimes as well, is that, you know, com- compromise is the first step towards mediocrity. mediocrity. Mm. And, like and so, you know, a great designer does not want to go do design by committee. Exactly. And, and they, they want to talk to the, the source of inspiration and not everybody else, which, as you can imagine, like can, can be can be a little bit challenging in, in its execution. Mm-hmm. If you will. <laughs> and um but but that that is where I think my individualization is on overdrive, and and I have this all over the place in my life. Like you know, I've even I've got, you know, one one of the areas where sort of my individual uh, relator really spike is in my personal life. I've I've just I've got a lot of friends from very early in childhood that I still see almost daily now, and. And, you know, I, I mean, we all do very different things in life. We all work on different stuff. We all are, have, you know, different sort of family setups and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I tend to see these individual unique qualities in people. And then my relator sort of pushes me to build really deep relationships with them. Mm-hmm. And so they're with you for life. <laughs> but it's not a big circle. Let's talk about significance. We can't, we have to talk about significance. No, no, no. I, yeah, no, no. When you said that command has a bad rap. Significance absolutely has Significance a bad rap. Significance has a bad rap. And and did you know this? Gallup, you didn't know this. Of course you wouldn't know this because you're not the biggest strengths geek like I am. Yeah, no, no. Gallup, that's why I need you in my Gallup life. Gallup recently rewrote the description for Significance because it Ooh. said you wanted to be important in the eyes of others. So this is the new updated version oh, of the wait. Significance short description is people exceptionally talented in the Significance theme want to make big impact. They are independent and prioritize projects based on how much influence they will have on their organization or people around them. And as a person, uh, gentlemen, I'd like to remind you that I have significance there on number <laughs> eight. So go easy, command. Well, my, my first question to you is, do you think that they've Diet Coke, they've, they've Coke Zero yes. down a little bit? Well, um, you know, it was really difficult to try to find the value in the first Interesting. description when I do these workshops around, you know, thousands of people, y'all, mm. right? S- many people have either said, this, I don't like significance. This is not a strength. Mm. Like, how is this a strength? Or other people have said that about people with significance. Like, that sounds like it's all about you. And would you be surprised to know that I have significance? Yeah, I, it, it would surprise me. I, I, I don't sense it. I think we have poster children in our vision of people yes. who have significance and maybe turned up too high to that weakness spot where you, it really does feel like it's all about them. But I think a healthy uh, dose of significance just says, I want to do stuff that do stuff that's impactful. It doesn't surprise me that you have it. 
But I see it as a strength. I, I see it as yeah, a real yeah, strength. Yeah. I also my my restorative right now is going. I bet I think Gallup to your to the point of this whole episode. I think Gallup wrote the first definition of the weakness version of it. Uh, I kind of agree. Right, because well, because I think that in their data they were translating the most dialed up versions of it in probably the wrong lanes, and then they wrote the definition based on that. Or maybe us with significance have a little bit of. Fragility I mean, to it just us. Sort of people with significance want to work on things that are important and that are going to be recognized for being important. I mean, right. isn't that is that not it? I think it is. It. And that's I not think, bad. Let, let me tell you a nuance of significance yes. yeah. for me. Like yes. this is how it comes to play with me. If I like to be the one, no matter what crowd I'm in, right. I want to be the one I don't have to be the best I don't have to be the winningest I need to be the one of something so mm. in my family I'm the only girl mm. in when I was an account manager at Rexpace I wanted to be the best account manager when I was at uh I want to be your strengths your strengths geek like yeah. I want to be your strength the number coach. one the number one well not number one I want to be the one so so I realize that some people are going to have better strengths than I am at doing certain aspects, but I want to be the, the, I want to be the, the guru. strengths guru for technology or nonprofit. Like those, I feel like those are my two strong niches and those are the things that I want to mm. exploit as much as possible and I want to be the one. Yeah. And let me ask another nuance. Okay. So that is in my head. Like I want to be the strengths coach for technology companies. There's only about, there's less than 10,000 strengths coaches in this world. Okay. So I think I have a pretty good shot at being like. You already are. What are you talking okay, about? Right. We're, All right. We're claiming superlative right here. Both. Awesome. So the second piece is, depending on who I'm sitting in front of in a presentation right now, my significance has that sensing ability and rises to an occasion. I find myself using words that are not part of not a part of my normal vocabulary. I become more articulate. I become more, my presence increases. That's significant. I don't Sounds know. very woo-ish. I don't know. I, well, okay, I've got good. woo too. Yeah. I've got woo too. But I mean, I also like, so to not, to, this, this is going to sound super significant, but I'm trying to show the, the, you know, tick marks in my brain of every organization that I've gotten to work at. I've made a, a um, presentation to the board of directors, including yeah. Rackspace. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, wow. Here, here is like an outside observer. Yes. To your yes. significance, Thank maybe. You. And tell, tell me if I'm thinking about it wrong. I'm happy to take the feedback. But you have ended up as the strengths coach for, you know, in our network. But I go back a little bit. And like, you know, I was, I was an observer at Rackspace to sort of watching your career Journey. within strengths take place. But it makes me wonder if we were working, at, let's say a much larger company. Let's say we were at Dell and strengths mm -hmm. was sort of this like HR thing over in the corner where there was like a hundred people working on it versus at Rackspace where, where it, it was is, one of the core strategies. It, is, it yeah. is not only one of the core things, but it's like Graham Weston, the chairman <laughs> of the company, like yeah. whoever is going to do strengths, like it's going to be a small team. Yeah. Gr you're going to get Graham's time yep. all the time. Yep. Like the, the, but it, but it's very important too. Like it's not like, it's like a really sort of small group. It, it, it it's very small group, but very high leverage, you know, high visibility. Thing. Like, so w in the, in the Dell example, do you think you would have gravitated towards strengths? Mm -hmm. Like, yes, you do because I've got individualization and maximizer. So I think it's a perfect fit for my strengths, but I would not lie if it was not, if it didn't have executive sponsorship, I right. don't know if it would have hit my radar. Right. Yeah. Because when I joined Rackspace, I was a little bit underwhelmed by these top five words. Like who cares? Right. Whatever, you know? And then, the belief in me also wants to live for a purpose. So this feels very purpose driven for yeah, me. I think it's great. To give people value. Mm. My individualization maximizer combination makes me naturally attuned to the differences in people and like how to keep pushing to leverage it. But my significance, no, I will super honest, getting to come from rack space, the place who does strengths better than yeah. any Couldn't other organization. Yeah. I mean that yeah. And, but I didn't leave Rack Space thinking that that's who I was or what I I brought to the table. I actually had to have some coaching to to grasp it. This is fascinating because I think that to Pat's example, I would I would ask it a different way. Let's say in Dell, because because I feel like in the Dell example, you could say I'm the strengths person within Dell. But what if in that example, all of the executives actually thought it was trash? 
Like what? Like they, yeah, they it was a legacy it. thing, but they were like, "Oh, yeah, that this thing over HR there. project." Yeah, this thing yeah. is a legacy. I would have hated it. Yeah. You just wouldn't have gravitated towards. You just wouldn't no. have gravitated at all. No. Yeah, I get it. No. So I mean that because I think you want to be, and I, I that makes sense to me because you want because I I have a there's a person with significance on my team right now, and I just think like because I used to the, one of the bad brands of it, which I think is incorrect that I had was oh you think that all these other things are beneath you. But that's not what it is. I don't right? think of it like that. I just think of it as you want a little bit of limelight. Like, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, yeah, know, yeah. you want to work on the important stuff that you get. No, but when I, when I think of my example, I'm thinking like, you know, so this person, I go, would you, would you wipe the tables at Geekdom? Like, would you? And I know they would. But that's not the core of their job, right? So my old brand was, you would think wiping the tables is beneath yeah. you. But actually, when I understand it, they go, no, no, they would do that happily and be do a good job of it. But if the core of their work every day did not allow them, to be a significant impact on the business, then they would absolutely uh, be disengaged and eventually leave. Yeah. I think culturally, we, we, we all sort of have an ick feeling about the significance of wanting to be in the limelight. But heck, we love movies, right? And those and actors have to have significance. I think about the world class significance person, Oprah Winfrey. Mm. Everything is named Oprah. And if it's not named Oprah, it's Harpo, which is Oprah backwards, like her production company. That's hilarious. It's all named after her. Wow. And I think, wow. Like yeah. And, 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 he, and people even say it's the Oprah. Of, so they, they call Tim Ferriss the Oprah of podcasts, right? I mean, just think about that. Yes. <laughs> That's true. Right? I mean, it's crazy. That's true. But, all, but also to, to your point about, you know, how commit. Do you know for a fact she has significance? No, we don't. Because she may anybody's. not. Like it, you know, it, it is kind of, it could be one of these things where it's just the smart business move to name everything Oprah. That's a good point. It's a good point. Yeah, but she's on the front cover of all of her magazines every single month. Yeah. You know, I think she probably has. She she, she is. No, see, but also because you have significance, you can diagnose it better than I can. Well, you know, it's it's something I'd do if I were (laughs) to. Just kidding. Just kidding. No, (laughs) just kidding. But I, I, but I, I think to Pat's point, you, you want people with command to lead because so many people don't want to lead. So many people want to be led. Well, and that's, yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. Yes, and significance likes to stand up in front of others, and we'll take the risk. Of and most people don't to want do to do that. And I mean, lots of people are fine sitting in the in the back wing. Just right? think about the the stat that what is like the number one fear of the whole world: public speaking. Right. Right. And with significance, you're like, Psh. I don't believe that. that but yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I I just. I think that sometimes if it's overused, it does look like it's all about me. And you may not be willing to wipe the tables or you may mm. not be willing to do the executing stuff that no one's ever going to know about those details because they don't, they don't matter. They're not significant. But you, okay, here's another redeeming thing about it. Yeah. So I just feel like, man, I love my strengths. <laughs> I can also help other people feel significant. Mm. But that's huge. I mean, that's the... I don't know. It's a... Yeah, his positivity thinks it's well, huge. People, no, it's huge because people want to feel valued. Yeah, I mean, they do. I, 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 do. I would challenge anyone I on do. that. I do. I'll get straight up command on that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, well, thanks for going through that one with me. I appreciate it. So you don't have harmony? I don't have harmony. Okay. No. It's his positivity woo. Yeah. Right? Manifests itself to... Yeah. I'm going to say yes, so you'll like me. Yeah. But I, but I, also, I also think that to me, a lot of it, I turn into... Uh, substraints of restorative and it also relator right don't you have relator somewhere it's in my top 10 so i wonder yeah. if all that combination makes him run for run from the conflict, the conflict. oh my god it's, it's uh, gives me the <laughs> heebie jeebies <laughs> just thinking about it, it but it, it's but but i know that the the hardest part of my positive view is the is the constant reminder that you cannot escape conflict in life and and it and it hangs it follows me like a black cloud which is you're you're only a couple of hours or days or weeks from the next conflict and i and and i think that the sooner i can get that through my thick skull the better i can prepare for it because i just used to avoid it and say please god let me avoid it for my whole life i don't even think about it i don't think about <laughs> conflict do you think about conflict yeah i do oh you think about starting it <laughs> well, well no you think no you think about things that you need can't to be make addressed. progress without conflict yeah but also, I think that there are things that you wouldn't classify as conflict that I would. That I'm right? sure that's true. Yeah, yes. because you'd say, "Look, we just got to talk about this." And to me, I'm like, right. "Oh God, Pat, just oh, I've been I was avoided that." And he just said, <laughs> "You know, right?" Oh, <laughs> uh, Pat. Well, I normally end every pat- podcast with the idea of what strengths do you have to obey, but you've given us lots of examples. Is there any <laughs> other example you want to talk tell us about about a strength that you have to obey? Because these things are connected to 
our needs, our motivations, they're very deeply connected to us. It's not just about playing to your strengths. I just think the, the idea of obeying your strengths is, you know, number one, understanding them, harnessing them, getting yourself in the right lane so that you can dial them up. And then inevitably you're not going to live, even if you find yourself in the right lane, most of the time, it's not going to be all the time. So you got to figure out when to dial them back down when you do. Obey Your Strengths is produced by Geek Day Media in association with Game Day Media Enterprises. Executive produced by Lorenzo Gomez, John Garcia, and Michael Largent. To learn more about Kathy Kirsten, visit her website, kathykirsten.com. That's K-A-T-H-Y-K-E-R-S-T-E-N.com.